And we are live. Welcome, everyone, to episode, what is it, 3077 of the Survival Podcast. It's a Monday. Uh, some Mondays I, I squeeze in a second Outback with Jack episode. Today we're not doing that, but it's going to kind of feel like one. We're just going to be on a single subject. Because it's going to be one of those shows where I just kind of have a chat with you, discuss things with you, try to teach you something, try to entertain you, try to be a mentor, and maybe try to smack you in the head a little bit. You know, because sometimes that's actually helpful. Sometimes a two by four between the eyes is what we need, at least a verbal one. And I want to wake some folks up today because I think this is a subject that we talk about a lot. And there's a lot of people that talk themselves out of it applying to them. They're the people that are like, I just want to be an employee. I want to work nine to five. I want to come home. I don't want to worry about it after hours. People that think that way probably need to hear what I'm going to say more today than people who don't, who who already in their head want some source of independent income. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Why now is the time to build an independent income? And those of you who have been listening to me for the almost 14 years that I've been on the air now, June the 20th this year will be 14 years officially of the Survival Podcast. We'll be like, Jack, you said now was the time to do this a year ago, two years ago, four years ago, eight years ago, 14 years ago. When you first started back in 08 and you were in your car driving up and down the road, screaming at ass clowns in between doing the podcast, you said now is the time to build an independent income or now is the time for a side hustle. Now the time was for now is the time for a business. And now it's time again. Well, my response to people that say something like that is, first of all, you're correct. I did say that. But second of all, did you do it? If the answer is yes, then, well, now's the time to take your income that's independent to a higher level. And I'm going to help you do that today. And if you didn't do it and you're pointing that out, then my response is shut up and do it. Now is the time for you because you haven't done it yet. Starting a business, building a side hustle, creating independent income, multiple streams of income, however you do it, is a lot like planting a tree. The best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The next best time is now. The next best time is tomorrow. The next best time is the day after that. If you haven't done it yet, get on with it. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And I'm going to tell you some reasons today why, like, yes, it was a good time or it was the time for you to do this a decade ago. But now it's it's now is more now. That's one of my metaphysical things I go with that, that sometimes now is only now and now is always now. There's never anything but now, but now is always becoming more now. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you think about that, that's some deep shit. And when it comes to starting a business, it really applies. Or it doesn't have to be a business. More on that in a second. Before we jump into today's topic, I do want to mention my two sponsors of the day for you guys. Uh, sponsor of the day number one today is Butcher Box. Now, I love Butcher Box. And we just had some friends over. They brought some wonderful steaks and we cooked them. They were delicious. And when we were having uh, lunch dinner, I guess, dinner yesterday with them, um, we were talking about buying beef right now. And I was like, how, how little we actually buy? Because between buying local from a guy that lives down the road from me and Butcher Box, we don't have to go to the market for beef much anymore. Butcher Box is such a great company that they don't pay me with money. They're the only sponsor I have that doesn't pay with, pay me with money. I have a credit on my account where I get a box of meat from them every month. So you know if I'm willing to take it as payment, there's a good reason I'm willing to endorse it. Check them out today at butcherbox.com. Remember, MSB members, you guys that are part of my private membership, you guys get a discount. It's $10 a month forever. And so people had some issues with that lately. My new rep over there, Daniel left. Our, our new rep over there is taking care of it. He has explained to customer service that, we, yes, we have that discount. And here's why customer service has had a problem with it. We're the only ones. We're the only people on the planet right now that have a recurring, ongoing discount with ButcherBox. They have separated themselves from a concept of being a discount brand, but we've worked with them for so long that they've continued to work with us. So check them out today at ButcherBox.com. Next up today, Backwoods Home Magazine. Really easy to endorse Backwoods Home. Why? 93, I got out of the Army. I got down here to Texas after I took a little bit of a walk on the Appalachian Trail and uh, went to a Barnes & Noble bookstore back when people went to bookstores. Found a copy of it on the shelf and said, man, this, this sounds like the way I grew up. And I was you know, new to a big city, fresh out of the military, trying to find my bearings. And it just became something I started reading on a regular basis. Got a job a few months later. First magazine I ever subscribed to. That was about early 94. It's 2022. I'm still a subscriber. What does that tell you about the publication? Learn more at backwardshome.com. All right. With that, let's dig on into this today. And what I want to start out with is why did I say 
independent income today versus start a business or build a business or become an entrepreneur? Why did I use the term independent income? And as we're doing this, I want to remind you guys, if you have questions or comments for me during the live stream in the chat, put your comments, at least first couple of words in all caps, and I will star them to come back to at the end of today's presentation. But yeah, I, I did independent income, not start a business, because I don't care if it's a conventional business or even something that somebody would look at and say, that's a business. If your plan is work your ass off and stack wealth into investments that pay dividends, whether that is through Bitcoin or real estate or, or stocks, th th you know, as long as you actually can pull it off, I don't care where the income comes from, as long as it's backed up with redundancies. Like, you know, you say you make money off your investments. Well, what happens if the stock market takes a 50% shit tomorrow? If you have an answer for that, I don't care where it comes from. If it's more of a conventional business like I run with the Survival Podcast, where it's a day in, day out business. Yeah, it's a podcast, but it's a business. Great. If it's more like I have a homestead and that covers my, you know, 50% of my grocery bill. And then I have a couple of little tiny houses that I use through Airbnb or Hip Camp and I rent those out. And it's all little pieces, parts, and it produces half the income you need to get along. I'm okay with it. And it's not really run like a cohesive business. That's fine. If it's, hey, you know what I do? I reload ammunition for my friends. Damn the government, pure agorism. And I make some money on that. And maybe I raise fish bait in my backyard, sell it to all my buddies. Maybe I run a poker. I had a guy that I knew that did this. He ran a poker night uh, every Saturday night at his house. And it was a big time poker game. Like he put on barbecue and food and everything, but he made like a thousand bucks a week. He didn't gamble his money away. He took a percentage of every pot. He made about a grand profit a week and nobody cared because they were sitting down playing poker. Literally, he had his daughters doing drink services. Um, you know, everything was covered. Barbecue rabbit was being served, things like that. And, you know, was that a legal business? No. Did anybody give a shit? No. He was in the, 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 the outback of freaking Louisiana doing this shit. And uh, he did it every week. Right. He had to know somebody that know somebody to even be invited to the game. And I don't care how you do it. I don't care if it's an above board lily white business. I don't care if it's a black market or a gray market business. Now, if you're going black or gray, you need to take certain things into account so that you don't end up in the wrong place. But I've always said that, you know, punishable by fine is, is translated to legal for a fee. So you, you take that and do what you want. But I don't care how you do this. I just care that you figure out a way to do this that works for you and that you are intelligent about any risks that you take both financially and from a legislative standpoint. But the reason that I say now is the time more so than at any other time. We are in a weird freaking place, ladies and gentlemen, a weird place in society today. We are in the middle of a recession right now that doesn't look like a recession because of numbers and bullshit, and what the media is telling you. If we had a Republican president right now, the media would be screaming this is a recession. I, I, honest to God, they would be. Um, and they would be right. But they wouldn't be able to explain it because the same thing they're using to shield against it would confuse them. You know, you can't, How do you have a recession when most states have unemployment rates under 5%? And even if we take like the people that aren't looking for jobs that gave up out of it, anybody that really wants a job, looking for a job, let's say... You know, instead of 4% unemployment, we really have six. How do you have a recession with a 6% real unemployment number, which is probably about right? Okay, it's probably about right for most of the country. It's what you would call, and I don't know that this has ever really happened before. There were pieces, parts of it in the 70s with stagflation. But I'm referring to this, and I don't know anybody else has used this term other than me, and it might be the first time you've ever heard this term. It's an inverse recession, an inverse recession. Everybody that wants a job has one. Wages are actually higher than they've been, even when inflation adjustment, if you use the CP lie or the CPI, right? Consumer price index. We've had wages increase significantly, at least keeping pace with the CPI, which again, I call the CP lie. Real inflation is outpaced wages. But 
on paper, you know, you got the ass clown in chief right now, Potato Biden, and his mouthpiece is saying, Joe Biden created more jobs than any president has in history. Well, when you're recovering from a complete shutdown of the economy, I'm sorry, but the Biden administration is just as full of shit as when Trump made the same claim his last year in office. If you shut down the economy and restart it and you use the where you pushed it down to as your baseline, of course, it looks like job creation. Government doesn't create jobs. Government only gets in the way of jobs. Government only causes problems for jobs. I was listening to some retard on Fox News the other day, and, and the guy asked a question. He, he asked the guest a question. He said, do you think presidents get too much blame and too much credit for the economy or not enough blame or not enough credit for the economy? Because do the pre, does the president really control the economy? And the guy said, well, I think, I think they get too much blame and too much credit because, you know, it's the private sector that actually does everything in the economy. And I thought, what a load of bullshit. If I would have been the host, I would have said, really? Then tell me a business sector in America today, small, mid, giant business that is not adversely affected by gas costing $5 a gallon. And whose fault is it that gas is $5 a gallon? Is it private industry's fault or is it government's fault? And then when he had no good answer for that, I would have said, okay. And so tell me a business that's not adversely affected by disruptions in the supply chain across the board like we're experiencing right now. And you could keep going. And all these things are things that government caused that interferes with business. You want my plan to fix the economy? Flat 10% tax rate. Every tax that exists that's over 10% right now goes to 10%. And I'm talking federal. Your state can do its own stupid shit. But federal income tax, 10% for everybody. Now, you're like, you're supposed to be an anarchist. I am. I would say no government. But I'm saying within the system. You, you, you give me the system and say you have to work in the system. But you can do reasonable things inside this system. Capital gains tax is 10%. Dividend tax is 10%. Business tax, 10%. Wealth tax, the wealthiest people pay 10%. The poorest people pay 10%. Everybody pays 10%. The economy would explode. And then remove as many regulations as possible at the same time. You'd have complete recovery of the economy in months. Because people would figure out how to deal with the supply chain issues in that situation. And a lot of the supply chain issues that we have, we wouldn't have anymore. Because then we would build, make, mine, produce that shit here in America, and we wouldn't be relying on this cross-Atlantic, cross-Pacific trade relationship for basic necessities like, oh, I don't know the raw materials we make our freaking antibiotics with. But none of that shit's going to happen. That's a pipe dream. Anybody, Matt, Jack should run for president. You're stupid. I'm not going to win. And even if I did, they wouldn't let me do that shit. You think the president actually makes these? So you got to do things where you control them. The other thing that's about to happen Everybody's losing their minds about real estate prices, real estate prices, real estate prices. Look at real estate prices. BlackRock's buying every single property. Bill Gates bought all the farmland. Okay, Bill Gates bought less than one half of 1% of the farmland in America. Let's let's stop freaking out about that. Now, I'm not saying he's a good guy or don't worry about it at all. I'm just saying let's not overplay that. But we've seen this before. Every real estate boom that's ever existed in anybody's lifetime, and in your grandparents' lifetime, and your great-grandparents' lifetime, every real estate boom, going back to the foundation of the United States of America forward to today, every real estate boom is followed by what? Dun, 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 a real estate bust. And the more money that pours in in the boom, the higher we go, the harder and further we fall. And you are going to see a real estate bust like nothing you ever seen before, because when you have companies like BlackRock and they're going in and they're buying properties at 20, 25 percent over market value with the intention to rent them long term. There is only a matter of time before when this recession really kicks in and possibly becomes an inverse depression. And then becomes a regular depression because of that. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you can't rent the house out that you owe that much money on? Good luck with it. Good luck with it. Good luck with it. Good luck with it. So everything is about to go sideways hard. Our best case scenario in the next decade is Japan for the last two, a sideways Skidmark economy. You know, and Skidmark is, and then the other term for Skidmark at the same time. That sounds like a terrible time to start a business. No, if you look, some of the most iconic brands, the wealthiest families in America were penniless in the 1920s. 
and their fortunes were built in the middle of the Great Depression. It is times of transition where the greatest opportunities are. And for every one of those families that's, you know, multi-billionaire family today, or the legacy of that family is a billion dollar company and the family itself got a few hundred million and went off and did something else. There's thousands of highly successful companies that grew small companies, the size that normal people actually want to run. One of those could be yours, but now's the time to do it. And there's literally nothing you can do to stop what's coming. You can't stop what's coming. You can't pray it away. Right. You can't pray it away. You can't vote it away. You can't lobby it away. You can't form a group on social media and make it go away. You can't build a new social media platform and make it go away. You can't run for office and make it go away. You can't start your own lobbying firm and make it go away. What you have to understand is the empire is crumbling and reconstituting itself. I think everybody thinks, you know, Carl Satan Schwab uh, the World Economic Forum, the Bill Gateses of the world, the Bezoses, the Bozo Bezoses, all these people are acting now because it was the plan all along. It's the it's the, the, the new world order, right? And they're coming for us and they want to put us all in cages and, and whatever. These people are the wealthiest people in the world. Everything that, that was going on was working perfectly for them. And if you study history, what you see is that these people, over time, whenever you see them acting against their own system that they built, it's because they know they've reached the end of that system and it's crumbling. They don't do it because they necessarily want everything in the next phase. They do it because they believe that they need the next phase because the house of cards they built is beginning to fall apart. The Ponzi scheme that is the Federal Reserve started in 1913 has had five different full-on defaults since it started. The first one, 1933 under Roosevelt, was a default. When we went off the gold standard as 100% back-to-back, we reclaimed the gold and revalued the dollar. That was a default. The silver monetization, or the demonetization of silver in 1964 was another default. Nixon was the default. You know, I could keep going, but there's been five. Five defaults since the formation of the Federal Reserve. And so what I'm what I'm pointing out then is how much longer do you think something that's already defaulted five times can go? This whole system's falling apart. Their empire is crumbling. It's time for you to build your empire. And understand that doesn't mean that they won't get a lot of what they want in the reconstitution and the new the new, new deal, right? That's what they're going to do. And this is what they always do. This is what they always do. And it's about self-preservation. One time I was growing some uh, vegetables and fruits right in bags, like soil bags you buy in a store. Okay. Take it home, cut a hole in it, plant into it, just laid it out on the ground, watered it. It works really well. It's a good place to get a quick garden while you put in a permanent garden. And that's why I did it, to show it could be done. But you really have to pay attention to your watering because if it dries out, there's no place for the plant to get more. Well, I let a watermelon dry out. And it had like four watermelons about the size of like, oh, I don't know, like a little bit bigger than a softball on it at that point. Nowhere near ripe. These were full-size watermelons. And I let it dry out. And the plant didn't die. There were like four or five watermelons on it. I came back and two of the watermelons were shrunk up like raisins. The plant, with its innate intelligence, knew I have no water. Oh, wait a minute. I'm a watermelon. There's all kinds of water in these two, you know, melons. Well, if I take the water back out of them, maybe I'll survive until it rains. And I still have three other watermelons. There's a lot of seed in there. The species exists to propagate itself, right? So under stress, and then when I watered it, it put a bunch more blossoms on it. Because it wanted to ensure that it could reproduce. Now, this is not a cerebral thing like a human, but it's an eight intelligence of a life force. This is how it progenerates. This is what your elite are doing right now. They're sucking their own children dry in an attempt to reconstitute and still go forward and still be in power. You need a business more than ever to survive this flux. Um. The only thing you really can do, like I said, there's so much you can't do, but what you can do is build something of your own. All this shit you're worried about, 
what 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 Schwab is going to do, what Gates is going to do, what Bezos is going to do, whether or not Musk is going to be able to buy Twitter, what Zuckercock's going to do, what any of these people are going to do. You get no say in that. And no matter who you send to D.C. or to your state capital, they're going to do the same shit. They have more money than you and they can buy those people you elect off. And they will and they do. They have a whole system set up to do it. But you can build a business. You can build an income source. You can create surplus value in your life. And if you have surplus value, you can barter it, you can trade it, you can sell it, and you can live off of it. That's what we're talking about today. And as we get into this, I want to tell you that I'm not going to be like, here's 10 businesses you can set up because it doesn't matter. I'm going to give you the formula to make any business, whether it's a conventional business or something unconventional, multiple streams, like a, like a profitable homestead successful. That's what I'm going to give you today. But to be able to do it, the number one thing that you're going to have to do is accept that it's all on you. And I heard somebody, this was during a management training class back when I was a manager in corporate America, a.k.a. a corporate whore, right? Selling myself to this company for my talent. And um, they would send us these classes on occasion. And every once in a while, there'd actually be something in that class useful. Probably 1% of the material was actually useful. And now I still use today. And this was one of them. They said, when you have an employee that you're managing and you've asked them to get something done and you come back and it's not done. And you're like, well, what's going on here? Why didn't you get this done? And they come up with insert excuse here, right? And they have an attitude of, but what can I do? But what could I have done? Like, here's this problem that was in my way. You didn't give me enough budget to get this marketing proposal done, right? Well, you could have done the proposal anyway and used it to justify asking me for more money for your budget, right? That's one way you could have done it. Or you could have come up with something with the budget that I gave you. Or you could have done both. And you could have said, this is what I can do with what you had. This is what I can do. And it didn't matter. If it was simply, I need you to make up a, a database of prospects. And you couldn't get into a company database to, 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 to cull through it. You could have went to some outside source and started creating a database of new prospective employees or prospects or whatever. Like you could have done something, but you didn't do it. And then, you know, you're sitting here and it's all management that's in this. And most of the management, to be fair to this company, was really switched on people. There were people like me and they were motivated. And we would have never had this problem before we were management. That's how we became management in this company. And, and when you're that person, it's very hard to understand how the person next to you sits there and does nothing while you get shit done. You Because it's, it's antithetical to you. And this, and so I'm, like, you know, spacing out because it doesn't really matter. I'm thinking about a budget report I have due or a forecast or some shit. And why am I wasting time here? But this guy says this and all of a sudden I'm like, ears are open. Okay. What do you got? He said, the person has a problem and you can explain it with three words. It's a lack of all three of these words, motivation, imagination, and determination. That That's it. That anything you come up with, the person is either simply not motivated enough. If I do this for this guy that I work for, what do I get out of it? I don't have enough of a carrot, right? right? I don't have enough motivation. I don't have enough carrot or I don't have enough stick. In other words, I won't get enough out of going the extra mile here. And I won't get fired if I don't. So there's not enough stick or enough carrot to get the person to do a thing. Imagination. They lack their creativity, even if they're sufficiently motivated that they feel like they really should do it. They can't imagine a solution that's not directly in front of them. Or determination. They want to do it. They can imagine it, but it's too hard. You know, it's too hard. It, 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 I, I, I just, you know, I, I don't know that I can do this, so I'm going to not do it. And there it is. You say that applies to employees, and it does. But it applies to a lot of great employees that have plenty of motivation, imagination, and determination inside a system designed to harness it, but put them on their own. Well, what business would I start? Okay, you don't have enough imagination. Probably not enough motivation. And definitely not enough determination, if that's the question you're going to ask me. Well, what should I do? Get motivated. Get determined. And then turn on your imagination. And it's amazing what you'll come up with. 
People like me, we hear from people all the time pitching us their great idea. And our number one response is, you should go do that. Even when we think, I wouldn't do that if I had nothing else to do. That's not business. Like, if you came up with it and you think you can make it work, we're like, well, the only way you're going to find out is put your shoulder to the grindstone and see if you can make it work. Can you do it? Try. Because we also know if you if you really try and you really give it all, if you use your motivation and your determination and your imagination, even if the idea itself is doomed to failure, it is going to morph into something that's going to become successful. In fact, the whole business unit may, may crash and burn into oblivion, but you'll come out of it stronger. You'll go through that crucible. And when you go to do your next thing, it's almost guaranteed that if you apply the same work ethic you did to your failure, you're going to have a success the second time. Or you're going to pull some remnant from it, like a database of customers that do like you and what you do. And you're going to change what you do, but you're going to keep those people following you. If you have enough motivation, imagination, and determination. And it is that simple. Don't See, people always want you to give them some sort of clever shit. That, that, like, wow, if I'd only known this 10 years ago, I would be a millionaire today. No, you wouldn't be. No, you wouldn't be. It's that simple. Will you get motivated enough to do what others will not and creative enough to make that work and determined enough to not quit when it gets hard? That's it. That's the whole thing. And it will get hard. When I started this show, everybody that looked at it said, holy crap, this guy starts a show, and in six months has 20,000 people listening to him. In 18 months, he's got a bang on success. He's making six figures, and he walks away from corporate America. Holy crap. That's amazing. Trust me, at about six months, when I was working full-time as, as a, a C-level officer in a holding corporation managing five other companies and doing this, I looked like a zombie some days. I'd be up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning getting the show ready so I could do it in the car on the way to the office. And then I went to the office and I poured my heart, guts, and soul into that for 9 to 10 hours a day. A lot of times I didn't get home till 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night because then I would be entertaining people who I didn't want to even be around because my partner asked me to to convince them to do business with us or some shit. So, yeah. At six months, my wife's like, I, this is not working. And I said, give me another six. Give me another six months. I believe in what I'm doing. That's the determination. Motivation, I didn't want to do the shit I was doing anymore. Imagination, I'm going to do it different than everybody says I should do it. I had so many people email me when I first started the show. If you would just build a bigger tent like Ronald Reagan, you could, I don't give a shit. I don't want a bigger tent. I want to do things my way every day, the way I want them done, being myself. And if you don't like it, piss off. Go somewhere else. Well, I don't want to go somewhere. Then don't. Don't you tell me that I need to attract people that are not like you. I only want people like you. That way, and I it was like seeing the future in my guts. I knew cancel mafia culture was coming. And I knew if I was fake, that it would get me. But if I was authentic, I would be bulletproof. There's nothing you can say. There's no Twitter campaign you can start. Jack Spirko sucks, hashtags, whatever. You can't do anything. And I want the same thing for you. I really do. So the only rules of sales and marketing you need to know. Because I, mean, I was just talking to a friend recently about possibly starting up a business that's more of a farm business. And he, and he said what I always say. You know, it's not about growing. It's about marketing. And if you can market, you can market anything as long as it's viable. And most things are viable if you can market it right. So here's the only rules of sales and marketing you need to know. First, and this is gold. If you take notes, this is when you need to start writing stuff down, guys. Okay, this is the things that made me successful. This is if I wanted to distill my entire success formula into what is it? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 12, 12 bullet points. Everything I know about success in business in 12 bullet points. This is what you're about to get. Number one. There are only two types of products. There's only two types of products you can sell. Now, I know you're going, okay, he's lost his mind. Somebody should take away his coffee. Maybe he's got something in there that's not just caffeine related. 
Maybe he did. Maybe he did more than pot when he was a teenager. Maybe he just burned a fat cell. There's only two kinds of products. This guy's lost his money. No, no. There's only two kinds of products. Yeah, I know. There's electronics and, and there's uh, there's ceramics and there's no. There's food and then there, no. There's physical product and there's non-physical product. That's it. There's nothing else. You tell me what's not a physical or a non-physical product. If it's an electronic download, it's non-physical. It's an information product. What you're consuming right now, as you listen to or watch this, is a non-physical product. If you become a member of my MSB and you pay me for that, you're buying a non-physical product. It's information. It's available. You just need to have your key to unlock the door and see what's behind the door. That's why it's so scalable. Right. If you like what I'm do telling you right now and you think, hey, man, this guy's giving me some real value and you super chat me in, in, in YouTube, not only will I thank you, but you've just made my point. You purchased a non-physical product voluntarily, completely. You did. I was giving it for free and you're like, hey, you know what? That's probably worth 10 bucks. Let's tip Jack 10 bucks. That's a non-physical product. Anything I can put my hands on. This is a remote control for the light that I should have. Nah, there we go. Turn the lights on for the extra studio lights that I should have had on. The, the little remote that's at the end and this little box in my hand, this is a physical product, okay? This coffee cup that says I'm not responsible for what my face does when you talk, this is a physical product. Somebody sent this to me as a gift because they thought it fit me. It had to be shipped. It's a physical product. That's it. That's There's nothing else. A service is non-physical. If you hire me as a consultant and I'm dumb enough to do it because I hate consulting, and I consult with you, it's a non-physical product. A service is a non-physical product. If I have a deliverable in that there's a printed out report and a binder that I leave behind, it's a non-physical product with a physical piece. So there's hybrids. That's it. This makes things dramatically simple. Because all you have to decide from the very beginning is, do I want to be in the non-physical or the physical product business? They both have advantages and disadvantages. I have a physical product it is much harder for somebody to take, for instance, and compete with alien gear. It's my carry holster, right? My air, alien gear carry holster for, for the nine millimeter that I was given by a very, very good friend as a gift, right? This holster, there's lots of holsters in the world, but this one has certain unique attributes. It is, I cannot control C, control V this. I have to get my own manufacturing in some way, whether I'm making it at home or I'm having some chop shop build it for me. That's an advantage to a physical product. It has disadvantages. I have to ship this. <clears throat> These sell for about 60, 60 bucks, I guess, somewhere in that range. Really great holster, by the way. Actually talking to these people, trying to get them in the MSB, right? But this is a physical product, and it has that value. The bad side, I have to inventory it somewhere. I have to make it. I have to deal with supply chains. If I can't get Kydex, I have a problem. If I can't get the neoprene that goes on the back of here, I have a problem. If I have a bunch of it in inventory so I can make my deliveries and all of a sudden people stop carrying a specific frame that they used to buy a lot of these for, I have a problem. And then when the person orders it, I have an expense. Somebody must pull it off a shelf, put it in a box, package it, and mail it out the door. It is a problem and it is an advantage depending on how you look at it. What about a non-physical product? Disadvantage is anybody can copy it. Anybody can mimic it. Control C, control V has worked for decades. And some version thereof of it will work. However, it's frictionless. If I want to sell MSB to you and you live in California and California says that certain things are illegal because I need to put a prop, whatever the hell it is, warning on this because something and it was determined to cause cancer if you burned it and blew up the nose of a, of a freaking hedgehog or something like that. I have to have that added expense. If I want to sell a non-physical product to you in California, I don't give a shit what California says. I don't care. <clears throat> it's meaningless. If if I had 10,000 new customers show up tomorrow for MSB, I have no problems delivering. If I did, I would call up 100 terabytes and say I need a second server. It's that simple. I have the ability to serve 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000 customers with about the same level of work, even if I got to a point with customer service that I needed somebody as an assistant, I could have one employee 
and I could outproduce in revenue what a physical product company can produce with 20 employees. 20 employees are 20 problems. You can have 20 problems or you can have one problem. Every employee will always be a problem. Your best employee is a problem on, on their worst day. So your worst employee is, it a pro, is going to be a problem on their best day. Anybody here in the chat that's ever had employees that backs up what I'm saying, please let me know. And I'm not necessarily talking about being a manager. It's own unique type of problems with your employees as a manager. I'm talking about when you are an owner or a major stakeholder, a principal in a company, and then you look at your employees and you look at your payroll, tell me you don't see problems. Even the good ones, even the ones you'll go to bat for, even the ones you'll forgive their discretions, they're still a problem. They get sick. They have life events. You stand with them through it, but they're a problem. They don't come to work because, you know, because they made an excuse because they have what I used to call bottle flu. That means you drank too much last night. You feel bad because they're actually sick or because a, a member of their family is all of a sudden dying. Now, you're a heartless bastard if you don't, you know, within every realm of the possibility of keeping your company running, give them the time that they need for that. But it's still a problem for you and a problem for your customers and your customers don't care. So the less employees you have, the less problems you have. Why do you think we're moving towards so much automation so fast? And I know some of you are employees and you hate hearing this. But if you are an employee, no matter how much your employer sees you as an asset, they also see you as a problem or at least a potential problem. And they're not wrong, period. Okay? They're not wrong. You are a problem the day you're not there when you're supposed to be there and they still have to get the job done that you're paid to do. Doesn't mean you're bad. It just is. And the more you do with physical product, the more employees you need and the more problems, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just you'll have to contend with. Or you're going to cap what you can do. You're going to cap what you can do. You start a little business at home, start making tea on the kitchen table with blends, selling it from a website. I know one of our MSB providers, right? Angie's Garden. That's what they did. They have a six-figure income today. If they want a seven-figure income, they have to have a little tiny mini version of an Amazon warehouse. It's up to them what they want to do with it. And you just have to accept that. Where the non-physical product, you don't. Next, every product that you will ever sell is bought for only one of two reasons. Again, did he burn a fat cell and pop some LSD from the past or something? No. Again, when I give you this answer, you'll understand it. People buy products for two reasons and two reasons only. They either want them or they need them. That's it. So when you develop your marketing, you develop to sell to the need and or the want. And it's very counterintuitive. You would think, well, then you should go into a business that supplies a thing that people need and sell to the need because that's the easy sale. Wrong. Wrong. And you lose. You're bankrupt now. How does that work? Like, his, okay, he's lost his mind. No, I haven't. The needs of society. And I don't want you to think about this like a caveman. We don't need electricity. Cavemen didn't have electricity. The needs of modern society are all monopolized. Even places you can enter, you have to sell to the want versus the need. Food is monopolized if you're selling to the need. Need means I need a certain amount of calories every day, or after a while I start to get skinny, and a while after that I die. That's need, the need food sale. And look at a supermarket industry. Look at the distribution networks. Look at all of it. Look at the packaging. Look at the crap food that they sell. Look at the ingredients. And everybody buys it. Everybody buys it. It's monopolized. You want to go into selling food, you don't go into the need food business. You go into the wanted food business. When people come under fire economically, the first thing they cut isn't their wants. It's their needs. What is the first thing they do? Can I get a cheaper cell phone plan? Whether you like it or not, communications in the modern world to get things done is a need. So instead of thinking, hey, you know what? I, I, I go out twice a, twice a month and tie one on at the bar and watch my favorite band and hang out with my friends. And that's 100 bucks a pop. That's $200. They take their $90 phone bill and try to cut it to $80 to justify their want. I'm not, I'm not judging it. I'm just saying when you are the supplier of a want, you'll get cut last. 
And I don't mean they won't say, I have to stop buying this. I mean that they won't bargain shop it. They won't bargain shop it. They'll, they'll, they'll keep buying it. This is why in the middle of an inverse relate uh, inverse recession, people like expert council member Nicole Sauce have exponentially built a boutique custom roasting coffee business. Because the person will cut their cable bill, unplug the cable TV before they'll go back to Folgers. People build loyalty to brands specifically when they provide wants. People start, still buy collectibles in the middle of recessions because they're getting good deals on them, right? Like this is reality. So even if you're in the needs business, if you're selling food, you're in the needs business. Everybody needs food, but they don't need your pastured chicken. They don't need your soy-free egg. Few people do, but in general, most people don't. There's another alternative to that, but they want it. And you need to sell to the want, even if you're in the business of needs. And all your marketing needs to go around the want. Features tell. Does anybody know the other side of that one? Features tell. Benefits sell. You sell the benefits. And when you sell benefits of a thing, you're selling the wants. Even if you're like, well, I'm selling this magic potion that makes people live longer. People want to live longer. They don't need to live longer. They want to live longer. In fact, if they needed to live longer, they wouldn't eat half the garbage they eat. So sell to the want. Okay. That's one of the bullet points there. Next. Um, there's only three true desires that all products fit into. Whether they're So you got physical and non-physical. And then the motivation behind the want in the purchase. Because the need's obvious. I don't have it, I die, right? But if we're selling on the want side now, we can break down why people are motivated enough to buy from you to only three things. Profitable, entertaining, life-changing. That's it. There, I know people want to break it. Whenever you give somebody these absolute definitions, they, they want, well, well, actually, no. I've been doing this a long time, guys. I've had everybody and their mother try to break this. You have to understand what I mean by the word. Profitable means that you in some way gain through the purchase. So I could buy Bitcoin, hold it, and sell it at a profit. And that's an obvious profitable relationship, right? That's obviously profitable. But what happens when you buy my MSB, you sign up for ButcherBox, and you save $120 this year? Did you just profit? Do you have a direct profit? You actually have $50 less. That's how much my annual membership is. You have $50 less. You get the discount code. You plug it in your computer to buy something that you wanted. And now you get a $120 return annually for a $50 investment. You have profited. You have no, not received any money. You have you've cut your outflow. Put a few more discounts on it. And now you're really profitable. That's one way that you can be profitable. The other way you can be profitable, though, and you can be profitable right now because I'm giving you shit that most people take, and instead of giving it to you an hour and a half, they put it in a course that takes 20 hours, and they sell it for thousands of dollars, and I'm giving it to you for free. You take the information I'm giving you right now for free, and you go out and do something with it, and you make money. It's profitable. See how that works? So one motivation is profit. Another is entertainment. If you tune in to me, not just because you learn stuff, but you think, you know, Jack, Jack entertains me. Like when I'm driving or when I'm like listening with my headphones on at a reasonable volume or whatever at work while I'm collating or whatever it is, not only do I learn, the guy's funny. He's entertaining. He says shit I don't expect at times. Every once in a while, he drops an F-bomb at just the right time, and I like that. Or I'm offended by it, and I like to be offended or whatever it is. That's entertainment. We also call it edutainment because education goes under profit. But if we can blend education and entertainment to that profit, then we have even more power. So entertainment. So remember I said about Nicole's coffee? If you buy Nicole's coffee and when you sit down and you drink that coffee, like I'm going to take a sip right now for my throat. You think, God, that's good. God, I'm not going to go to Starbucks and I'm not going to buy Folgers. It's entertainment. 
It's not entertainment like going and listening to a rock band, right? Going to an Aaron Lewis concert or something. It's still entertainment. When you go out to eat and you sit down with your friends, it's entertainment, right? When you go to a movie, that's obviously entertainment. You go to a concert, it's entertainment. But you pay to go to the zoo. And you go in and look at all the animals. You get education, but you also get entertainment. Most things that people spend money on that are not physical products, okay, are at least partly entertainment. When you pay for a Netflix subscription, if you can find something entertaining on it, you're paying for entertainment. So, again, now what would that be? You, you don't need it, but you want it, and it's entertaining. And start seeing those connections. Next, the only other one is life-altering, life-changing. You buy my diet program because you lose weight and you feel better. I've just changed your life. You buy my educational product, somewhat motivated by profit, but you want a better life. So you buy my business course, and you're not really directly motivated by the money, but what you're really motivated by is what the money will empower you to do. Right. That's life changing. I, you know, Ken Berry starts a YouTube channel. You don't directly buy anything from him, maybe. Right. You're not on his Patreon or whatever. You watch all his videos. Why? Because if you switch your diet, you'll go from looking like I used to to looking like I do now. Life changing. See how that works? So, this is what you have to work with. These are the only things you have to sell physical and non physical, want or need, and always go to the want. And then are you selling to profit, entertainment, or life-changing? And if you can do all three, I don't care if it's physical or non-physical, you have a product that people find profitable in their lives. They are entertained by it. And somehow it actually makes their life better than you have the Survival Podcast. <laughs> but you do. Why do you think I built it the way that I did? Do you think I just like accidentally did this? Or do you think that after being in business for 25 years, working for myself and others at the same time, as a partner, as an employee, right, that I took everything that I knew and said, if I'm going to do this for myself, I'm going to take everything I know and I'm going to build it in the way that, that most advantages my success. Just like when we do permaculture and we put the broccoli in the bed, we advantage the broccoli to the disadvantage of the weed. Same thing. And so this is what I've referred to. And again, this is another term that I have never heard anybody else use. The golden trifecta of marketing. It is If, if you're going to go into business today, in my opinion, you want to have this trifecta. Now, you may lean towards something else, but you want to market to all three. Remember what I said? Like, I have this place, this little homestead, and I put in a couple... Uh, tough shed, tiny houses, and it's like a glamping site, and I make it really neat. So you would think that the main thing I'm going to sell to there is that it's entertaining. And you're right. That's going to be my lead. Look what you and your family could be doing right now. You could be sitting here watching my ducks walk around, looking at my food forest, having your own little place. If you want to play music, unlike the freaking state park, no Karen's going to come yell at you. You don't have to worry about a generator. It is a wonderful vacation spot. Look at all the shit that's around it that you can go to and you have this place to come back to and nobody will bother you. I'm selling the lead of entertainment. But I'm also going to say, and compare it to the price of a Ramada Inn. Hence, it is profitable, right? And I'm going to sell the experience after you leave. You'll remember your time here. Make memories with your children while they're still at home. I'm going to sell all that shit. I'm going to sell, even though it's not like a permanent life-altering thing, the way that I honestly believe my podcast is. You get into my podcast, I think it changes your life for the better. If you act on it, I'm still going to sell a little piece of it. I'm going to try to drag anywhere that it will fit that golden trifecta, and I'm going to build my marketing on it. I'm going to find my lead. And we think of triangle, and I'm going to have my lead at the top of the triangle, and I'm going to have my two supporting elements. So I actually, you you would probably say that I lead with life changing on TSP. I lead with entertainment. 
No one listens to a podcast for more than 10 minutes unless they're entertained. So I lead with the fact this is entertainment-based content that provides an education that is profitable. And if acted upon, it will change your life for the better. But I'm not going to start out with, listen to me and I shall change your life. Because you're like, screw this dude. He's full of himself. And you'd be right. Then you're taking yourself too seriously, right? And somebody's saying, Ramada Inn is probably pro-mandate. And you know what? I don't know if that's the case now, right? But two years ago, a year ago, it was. Like, you go to a hotel and they're like, well, you have to wear a mask. I'm going to point out that you don't. Why would you? You're on the back of my... And if you want to knock yourself out, Karen, go ahead, right? I probably don't want you here anyway, because nobody else has got it. I'm going to market what I have to the truth, right? Anyway, um, yeah, if you take yourself too seriously, then you'll drive away people before they look at what you have. And marketing is about not selling. Marketing is about getting people to pay attention and look and evaluate you. Selling comes next. That's where we convert the person from looker to buyer, right? So with that, we can move into what is sales? What is it's like? You ask 20 salespeople what sales is. You get different answers from all of them, and they're all complicated. They all involve several paragraphs of talking about their philosophy and how you actually sell and how selling the physical is different than selling the non-physical and blah, 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 blah. Horseshit. Selling has an absolute three-word definition. And again, I like absolute definitions, and I challenge you ever to break it. Selling is transfer of belief Full stop. That's it. Transferring your belief from yourself in what you're selling to the person on the other end of the deal to the point where they believe it will make their life in some way better. It will entertain them, educate them, profit them, right? Change their life for the better. So if I'm selling gutter guards, right? The little things that go on top of your gutters to keep the leaves from going until you don't have to go up there and clean it anymore. Hey, what am I selling? I'm selling you a want. You don't need it, right? You don't want to climb a ladder and pull gook out of your gutters anymore. I'm actually selling you, in that instance, a life-changing product. No longer, Karen, will you have to go up the rickety step ladder and pull the gook out of your freaking rain gutters. Our pros will come out there and do it for you, and you can forget about it, and your foundation will be safe forevermore. See? And see, you can sell life altering if you're selling it at that level. Or when you're totally focused and you're like a Tony Robbins info guru dude, and that's your whole shtick, guess you can do it successfully. My experience has been when you trick people into taking the right steps to change their life for the better by educating and entertaining them first, you have a lot more success because people are resistant to change. But you can do it any way you want. But you have to transfer belief. Sometimes people take sales and marketing and they put them together because you market effectively and somebody comes to your website and they just buy and you never had to talk to them again. You built a great website. You built a great marketing message. You pulled them in through the funnel and they converted on their own because they got the belief transferred to them. This widget really will make my tomatoes grow faster and bigger and stronger. That's what they were motivated by, and that's why they bought. There had to be a point where the belief was transferred. So what's marketing? Marketing, friends, also has a three-word absolute definition, full stop. And that is telling your story. That's it. That's it. You can go to freaking college for four years and get a marketing degree with a 4.0 GPA and come out and I'll say, what is marketing? You don't fucking know that. I know I've hired people like that into marketing jobs and went, good Lord, you don't know. What do they teach you? Telling your story. That's it. And why does it work? Because we're humans. We tell stories. This is the foundation of civilization is the telling of stories. The most published work on planet Earth, the most read book that's ever existed in the history of mankind is the Bible. Religious or not, it is. Get over it if it bothers you. It is. It's a collection of stories. The genesis of the Bible, pun not intended, was handing down stories that were eventually written. 
Everybody has stories. Everybody has stories. Sit down in a group of people bound by anything in common. Wait 10 minutes, put a beer at a couple of them, and you'll hear stories. Talk to a fisherman. You're going to hear fishing stories. Talk to a soldier. You're going to hear soldier stories. Talk to a veterinarian. You're going to hear stories about animals. Talk to a farmer. You're going to hear farmer stories. And you'll hear other stories. So we innately tell and listen to and engage. And when we find people where we like telling them our story and we like hearing those, we develop relationships. And when we find people, when they tell a story, our eyes glass over, and this is not for me, we tend to not build relationships there, right? That's how we form social groups and social hierarchy is through stories. So it's natural. So if I want somebody to look at the survival podcast, I need to tell the story. I tell the story of how it started. I tell the story of what it is and what it can do. That's marketing. So it's viral marketing because everybody wants to go viral. Viral marketing is when you do such a good job of telling your story and delivering on your promise that the simple definition of this is when other people tell your story. That's all viral marketing is. When 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 concerned Karen buys your, you know, uh, beyond organic, soy-free, non-GMO fed duck eggs, and concerned Karen tells, you know, caring Teresa about those eggs and caring Teresa calls you up and says, I want to buy those eggs too. That's viral marketing because you've done a thing and it's gone beyond the people you, in, you directly reached. That's what makes it viral. It takes another step. And the more steps it takes, the more powerful it is. And it's not new and it's been around forever. It's just on steroids today with something like the internet. When you have the internet, one person may already have 10,000 or 20,000 or 2 million people listening to them. And then when they simply say, hey, I bought from this person and it was really a great experience, you'll get more sales from that one referral than from a year of marketing. Because when you tell your story, people are naturally skeptical, skeptical and they should be. They should be. Of course, I'm going to tell you that my slicer and dicer slices and dices better than any slicer and dicer. Of course I am. And even if I'm telling you the truth, you're like, yeah, sure it does. Even if it's compelling, even if you're like, I'm even willing to buy one and find out. Until you do, you're like, "Mm -hmm, yeah, I'm sure it's the best one ever. But when somebody you trust who wasn't paid to tell you about it, says, I bought one of these things and it freaking works. You're a lot more likely to go check it out. You st- you've been marketed to virally. You still need to be sold. Now, if marketing's powerful enough, you get into what's known as pre-selling. The marketing's so powerful that the only way the prospect isn't going to buy is if something goes wrong in the process. I tried to sign up and it wouldn't work. I tried to sign up and ask for a piece of personal information I don't want to give. I tried to sign up and I saw reviews and they all said it sucked, right? But if that doesn't get in the way, if you don't destroy the business for yourself, there are there are viral marketing, especially more than self-marketing, that the person will come there to buy. All they want to know is how. So you got to make the process easy if it's an online sale. And if it's they have to contact you, then it better be real easy to contact you, right? That would be uh, something you need to make sure you're doing. And then the last piece in this, people will help you. People will help you. Trust me, I did not get to the level of success at TSP that I've got without help. My first real microphone, somebody took one and mailed it to me and said, your show is too good for the quality of microphone you're using. And they sent me my first Samsung CO1U. I liked it so much when it finally crapped out after about seven years of using it every day, I bought another one. It's it's just past the Yeti over here. I run two microphones now, two different machines, redundant recording. But somebody sent me that. The original Survival Podcast Forum, which has kind of been taken over by social media as times changed, that was run by people in the community that wanted to run it, that built it up. There were people who put the show on CDs back. That's how old the show is. There used to be CDs and basically threw them through people's windows. Hey, listen to this guy. 
There were people in the Appleseed Project of the shoots that went to took the rifle of uh, the rack rifles that people come in and are able to shoot and put TSP logos on them. The logos came from stickers that other people made. I did not get here by myself. There were people that blogged about me. There's tons of people that helped. But here's the interesting thing. It doesn't, I don't want you to take this the wrong way. It doesn't mean it wasn't valuable. And it doesn't mean that we're not more successful because of that than we would be if people didn't do it. But people generally don't help you until you don't need it. Not it's not useful. Not it's not beneficial. But you have demonstrated, I'm not going anywhere. I do what I say and say what I do. And I make my commitments and I have a level of success. That's when people are comfortable telling their best friend about you or contributing to you or becoming your customer, right? The first customers you get, man, those are people that are true believers in what you're doing. They just want to see you succeed, right? That, 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 that's the first customers. And it's those customers that will get you enough success that people looking in at you. And when they look in at you, they'll say, hey, I like what this person's doing. Like, I want to be part of what they're doing. And they'll start talking about you on social media. They'll share you with their friends. They'll become your customer, even if they don't need what you have. They don't even really, really want it for themselves, but they don't want you to go away. And that means that you have to work your time tail off. And Jonathan's asking, why did Unloose the Goose End? That's a very non-related to this presentation uh, uh, question. And you can go watch the last episode of Unloose the Goose, and we explained why it ended. So anyway. Moving on, um, I'll give you some final thoughts here. Number one, I just gave you everything you need. If you showed up today and thought, Dak's going to tell me to start a business, it'll be something like do a dog grooming business or something. No. The idea is you. The concept is you. The product is you. The, the source of the product is you. Know, you. So are you going to have it manufactured? Are you going to make it yourself? Are you going to buy it and resell it? Are you going to flip it? What? That's all you. The how, the pieces, parts, the formula. This is the key. There's nothing you can't sell with this if it's worth selling in the first place. Now, if you sell people a product that breaks, it's going to have limit. You could sell a shitload, right, in your first six months until word gets out, and then you're not going to anymore, right? That That's how that works, right? You do have to have a good product, but any good product, Product, good marketable product with this formula cannot fail if you have enough motivation, imagination, and determination. I gave you everything you need today in an hour's time. We're going to go over an hour, but you already have it. Next, the rest is only academics and action. There are things you'll have to learn specific to your business, your product, your market. That's academics. And there are things you're going to have to do, and that might involve getting out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. So that a year later, people can tell you how lucky you are, even though they weren't getting in your way at 3 a.m. when you were coming down the stairs going to your office. But it's still simply action. Academics and action coupled with what I gave you will make you a success if you actually want it. Next, the only thing I really can add to this at this point is the permaculture principle of apply self-regulation and accept feedback. You're the one that has to kick your own ass to get in motion, to get things done, to do the projects. Like, I don't know how many entrepreneurs, well, I really need to do this and I really need to do that. I really need, like, and it's like they have all this shit they need to get done. And I'm like, well, fucking pick one and do that today. Well, you don't understand. No, I understand completely. Pick one and do it today. Well, I can't finish any of them in a day. Pick one and get started on it today and keep doing that one thing until it's done. And as soon as that box is ticked, do the next one. I mean, you're going to have to use self-regulation, but you're also going to have to accept feedback. And this is something entrepreneurs are terrible at. It's what makes us successful and it, what's make us, it makes us fail at the same time. We believe in a thing. And generally, the people around us can't see how it's going to work. I don't think you can build it. You know, when I started the podcast, not only was I told I needed a bigger tent, man, this 45 minutes to one hour, I... Nobody listens to podcasts that long. Gee, I don't know. The most successful podcaster on the planet today does three-hour podcasts. Longer than I got in me. But I had everybody. You, you, you're doing too many. You're doing too many. And they're too long. Well, you're listening. You wouldn't be bitching and telling me I'm wrong if you weren't listening. And I did things my way. And that's great. But you still have to accept feedback. 
if people are telling you you're wrong, but it's working, pedal to the metal, full forward, everything, march! Screw the people telling you you're wrong. If you're not being successful, there's your feedback. There's your feedback, guys. That is your feedback that matters. That's, that's where you have to say, hey, if I was right, I wouldn't be broke. I would have revenue coming in. Now, if it's working and you can see it working, maybe it's small tweaks or maybe it's just more. But if you're pouring your guts into something and you're not getting growth at all and you work harder and you still don't get growth, it's not the work ethic. It's the work and it needs to be redirected. You have to accept both self-regulation, in other words, to make yourself do what's necessary and feedback to stop doing that which is not working or maybe something needs to be added to it. You got to figure it out. And in the end, guys, it's now and has always been and shall always be all on you. This The, the key ingredient that every single successful business from solopreneur content creators like myself or humble mechanic who's been joining us and giving some great advice to people in chat there. Hey, humble, how you doing? You know, we're solopreneurs. We're info product people, right? From us up to the person that builds a company that has thousands of employees. The common denominator is action getting things done. You know, old bear here says, just do it. Quit procrastinating. Absolutely, guys. Awesome dude, says humble mechanic, right? It, it is your willingness to act. And what I'll end with is the dash again. We live in this world where we self-seduce ourselves into being pathetic. Well, one day, one day I'll do it. You know, I'll always have tomorrow. I'm going to work here another five years and then I'll think about starting a business. And no, you won't. In fact, what that makes me think of is one of my good friends and guys have been on the show a couple of times and fellow goose, John Dowie. He came and did a fantastic set of presentations at one of our workshops on microgreens. How to grow them, how to market them, how to find customers, like everything on the internet. Here's how you find the restaurants so the right restaurants to sample. Here's how you sample them. This is what you do. Here's how you grow. Here's how you start. Start with these five. These are the best microgreens to start with. This is how you grow them. This is how you sell them. Go do this. This is how much money you can make. You know what? Tons of people walked up to him. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Thank you. I'm going to do this. And they'd walk away. And as soon as they were out of earshot, John would look at me and go, no, they're not. They're not going to do anything. I can already tell. And I think with the exception of one person, out of all the people who said they were going to do it, he was right. They weren't going to do it. Now, I think it was still valuable to him because a lot of them started doing it for themselves and maybe as an add-on or something like that. But nobody except for one person that was at that workshop grabbed it and went with it and made it happen. Now, the person that did it, I'm not putting them down, but I want you to understand something. There were people that had a lot more to start with and probably were smarter on an IQ level and probably lived in a place that was better to do the business than the one that did it successfully. But the one that did it successfully, what did they have? What did they have? They had MID, M-I-D. That's how you remember it, right? Motivation, imagination, and determination. The reason that poor people make the best entrepreneurs is the M in MID. They have the most motivation. I'm going to answer a few things you guys gave me in all caps. If you have any more, get them in now because I'm going to go through this once and wrap up today. I got a lot of work to do out on the farm. Um, but there was a, I don't remember who the speaker was. It was somebody like a Harvey McKay or a Zig Ziglar, but I don't, I don't think it was either one of them. Back when I was young and broke and driving around in my car in sales and I had all this time and there was no internet, no podcast. So you, you know, rented or bought DVDs, not DVDs, CDs. And I became a big customer of half price books. And I go straight to the audio because you can't read when you're driving down the road. At least you shouldn't. And I remember this uh, CD set. There was a guy told this story on it. And uh, 
told the story of this guy, we call him Lee. I think that was his name, but it could be wrong. It's somebody that came to here from Vietnam in the 70s at the end of the Vietnam War. And he got here and he didn't have anything, but he had an uncle that was already here. And that uncle owned a donut shop. And Lee went to his uncle and his uncle was doing fairly well for himself and said, uncle, can you help me? And his uncle said, I'll give you a job. You and your wife can run one of my donut shops. And Lee was like, if that's my only option, I guess. It's, and he said, you know, I, my house is nice, but I don't have a lot of room. So you can't live in my house. I'll give you a job. You work at the donut shop. If you need to, you can live in a donut shop. So for two years, Lee and his wife lived in the donut shop. They slept in the back. They used the sink to bathe. They lived in a donut shop. They got cots. They slept, you know, in the behind the, the donut shop. So they ran a donut. Most donut shops run from early in the morning till mid-afternoon. Closed down. They took care of themselves there. Ate leftover donuts. Saved money. After two years, they saved up enough money to buy a house outright. They talked about it. And instead of buying a house outright, they went to the uncle. They bought the donut shop. They lived there for another year. Then they went and bought a house that they paid for in full on a year running a donut shop. They kept doing that and they realized in owning that home that they had something that they could have never had back in Vietnam, property ownership. They now had two properties and they figured out in America that once you own property, it was easy to buy more. And the more you owned, the easier it was to buy more. And they transitioned from being donut entrepreneurs to real estate entrepreneurs. And they started buying um, properties. And Lee became an incredibly wealthy person by the mid-80s, having arrived here with nothing except the clothes on his back and his wife in the mid-70s. Now, the reason wasn't really imagination. It was motivation and determination. If you have enough motivation and determination, the imagination will appear when you need it. And this is why people who are poor become wealthy and people that are middle class don't. It's comfortable to be middle class. And then the motivation lacks and all the people that truly want more. And this is one of our biggest problems in America. We have not just made middle class really comfortable. We've made poverty comfortable. We've made poverty comfortable. We've made poverty living off government money more comfortable than being lower middle class on the way to middle class on the way to upper middle class affluent. That the, 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 the delta in between poverty and living off the government and truly experiencing the gain is actually pretty narrow, but we've convinced people in their heads that it's a great chasm and you might fail. And then you might not be able to go back into being poor and paid for. So, We've ruined that. And that's why our immigrants are so freaking successful. Somebody mentioned Zig Ziglar here. And maybe he was a source of story. I don't remember. But he I remember one story he did tell on this bent that's so true. And I'll take your questions and comments. He said he was on an airplane sitting in first class. And this little girl, probably six years old, gets on the plane. She gets on the plane and she looks into the cockpit and they had to just, you know, they used to have the doors open. All those things and the two pilots sitting there and you see out the window and all the controls and the steering and all the stuff and overhead. And then she looks down. She looks down the corridor, all the way down the plane, big giant 747 or whatever, all those people. And she went, God. And he said, that's why you don't do it right there, because you lose that. You're not impressed. When I was a kid, I remember the first time I ever had food out of a microwave. My dad dropped me off. My grandmother worked at this diner. She said, you want a piece of pie? The kid, like seven years old. Of course I want a freaking piece of pie. Yeah, that's how old I am. The first time I ever ate food out of a microwave, I was seven years old. And they didn't really have them in, in people's homes very much yet either. 
Rich people had them and diners had them apparently. She says, you want the pie hot? I'm a kid. I know grandma's off soon. I want to go. I don't want to wait. I want my pie. So I'm like, well, how long will it take, grandma? She said, a few seconds. Took it out of one of those little spinny things the old diners used to have. Hot pies, ice cold. She walks behind the counter. I don't really see where she puts it. I really don't know. I'm a kid. I'm spacing out like kids do. About 30 seconds later, she puts this pie in front of me, and it's steaming hot in the center. And I know damn well it was ice cold 30 seconds ago. How'd you do this? She said, it's called a microwave. We got one about a year ago here. They're going to be in everybody's house soon. I said, oh, my God. You can make pie hot in 30 seconds. Who's impressed by that anymore? You lose that wonder. You lose the motivation. You lose the imagination. You lose the determination. You want to be successful in business? Have the discipline of an adult and the mind of a child. All right. So, Gotatious Billy says, hey, Jack, what's the difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash? Does it matter? It matters a great deal. It has absolutely nothing with what we're talking about today, but I will answer it anyway. Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin that has failed in every measurable way to take over in the number one seat that's out there. Its value proposition is it's faster and cheaper to send and nobody cares except people that still believe in it. So if you want to invest, invest in Bitcoin. Uh, Bobby, and if you want to send Bitcoin fast, use your Lightning Wallet. All right, Bobby Joe Woods. I started learning HTML in 1998. In 99, started doing web work on the side as a full-time office job. Went full-time from home in 2005. Haven't looked back. I still work on websites, but also on Jerky now. See, that's great. That's diversity, right? When your web business goes down and you don't have as many clients, Turn up your own web marketing and market your jerky, right? So, yes, multiple streams of income I endorse highly. Daniel Smith, question, given the current housing market and likely coming crash, should those considering relocating sit tight for now? We're looking but finding it difficult to make math to work right now. It depends. If you're going to move to downtown Houston, probably, right? A suburb of Dallas, probably. I don't see this crash, this correction in property prices affecting a lot of the types of properties that the people in this community are looking for outside of the cities kind of country properties rural couple three acres or more they're not going to get hit as hard and they never have when the real estate crash hit in 0809 it didn't make a property in rural nebraska cost much less but Nice properties in Florida, in Phoenix, in Atlanta, in California, in Pennsylvania, you know, Westchester, nice parts of New Jersey and all. That's where all the real estate crashed. And it's what I expect to see happen again. So when you say I can't make the numbers work right now, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, what are you doing to try to make them work? Shop harder, save more money, cut more expenses and shop harder, right? And it depends. Like if you're trying to find in a limited geography, you you know, if you don't have the money, you don't have the money. Don't buy a property when you can't afford it, no matter what. But if you're thinking, I'm going to wait till the market crashes because Jack says it's going to crash. Number one, remember, right? Stuff like that can always change. Something can always happen. Somebody can always kick the can. And maybe even if it does happen, it pushes the time horizon too far out for you. If you want real estate in your portfolio, the key is not to wait, but to figure out how to buy it under value today. And it can be done. And remember what I always say, ask, how can I? Stop saying you can't. Stop saying the numbers don't work. How can I make the numbers work? What can I do to find a better value in property? Where are the values right now and how do I find them? Then your mind will see it as a willing challenge and it will go to work. And the most powerful computer in the known universe, the human mind, We'll start working for you instead of against you. Alt Arc says, do you think the housing market in Texas will behave much better than the rest of the country when the Fed interest rates and housing market corrections smack together? Better and still bad. The thing that saved our ass here in Texas, it's our economy. No, 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 no. What saved our ass here through two real estate busts since I've been here. I got here in 93 and I've seen two pops of the real estate market and texas do way better than the rest of the country 
We didn't go stupid with our prices. When you could buy a four bedroom house that was small, 1500 square foot in California for 700 grand, you could buy one here in Texas for under 100. We didn't get stupid. You could buy a, my first home in Texas. This is 98. Bought my first home, 98 or 99. Three bedroom, but it was huge for a three bedroom. My bathroom was bigger than a lot of people's secondary bedrooms. My living room was massive. My smallest bedroom in that house was 12 by 16. The master was something like 24 by 18. This is a Big three bedroom, huge kitchen, two story, nice yard, not huge, but a nice yard, good neighborhood. I paid $84,250 for it, $84,250. I know it was 1998, but if you know the rest of the country and the real estate market at the time, stupid cheap. Only going back eight years when I bought this place. Three acres, two shops. Some of you have been here. 1,800 square foot shop and an 850 square foot shop. 2,500 square foot house. Three acres fenced. 205. 205. Now, it was a deal even for here, but it was doable. You are not buying a place like I have eight years later for 205. You're not buying it for 405. My property value was assessed at 450 and when I tried to fight it, and I even looked like maybe I need a little professional help this time instead of just petitioning myself, even the companies that do it for a business are like, nope, won't, won't work. We ran up the real estate this time like everybody else. We're going to get hit hard too here in Texas, at least in the high density areas. We're going to have a bust. K Bonk says value added product or service. I agree. It's not really a question though. Cletus says, Jack, you ever considered a cooking channel showcasing how to use homestead produce? No, I have not. Maybe you should. I have my own thing to do. I don't have the ability to do another thing. Right now, I, I have said before when asked if you weren't going to do survival podcast anymore. And you had to go into a business on content creation. What would you do? And I would do cooking. Cooking and diet and nutrition. Because yes, it is one of my other passions. Right. So if I if I couldn't do the TSP stuff, aquaponics, aquatics, and ever, I had to do something really in a different zone. Cooking is what I would do. Lisa says, Jack, we share ideas with each other in the chat, which is another value. What an incredible community you have built. Thanks. I I completely agree with Lisa here. I think one of the most powerful things about TSP is you guys communicating with each other, even when I'm not involved. Like I'm the catalyst and then you guys get together and form your own groups and subgroups. And that's the Telegram channel. That's the MeWe uh, community and the MeWe group. That's Float. That's Gab. That's every place you guys, Discord, right? All of that. And then the meetups, like people do meetups. Like literally like every, you know, Sunday they have coffee together at IHOP or whatever, you know, all of that is an incredible value. Humble mechanic says, Jack, man, if people knew how good they could have it, even when it's a bad day. Yeah. Yeah. My worst day is better than a lot of y'all's best day. Really? Even sometimes when you hear me get on the air and I bitch like what a bad day it was or whatever. F this day or whatever. Yeah. It's still better. It's better for a bunch of reasons. One, even if it is logistically worse, I know what my tomorrow is. And I know how to prevent that day from coming back. And I can control that. You have a shitty day at work, you dread going back. I have a shitty day in my business. I look forward to the next day when it won't be that way. Um, Humble also says, um, Philippine Nomad, all the lucky, ha, ha, ha. I guess he's just saying, yeah, everybody that, that says that, luck. Uh, Philippine Nomad says, luck equals opportunity and preparation. Jack, Nicole, Charles, how lucky you guys are. Yeah, if you mean it that way. And I am lucky, right? I am very fortunate that all the shit I did wrong in my life, I still had enough second chances to do it right. And, and luck 
is really where opportunity and preparation come together, right? Like you will walk past thousands of opportunities in your life. Some you'll see, some you won't even know they were there. Everybody has opportunities every day to change their life for the better. Seldom do they take them. And many times, even when they recognize this is a great opportunity, they have not prepared enough to be able to take the opportunity. And then they run to somebody and they want somebody else to make it happen. If you just loan me money, man, oh, no, I promise you that shit ain't happening. I'm not loaning you money, man, for an opportunity that you only get once. Because by the time you're, you've said that, I already know you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Jonathan says, Jack, I bought a bunch of seeds. Do you think I need a greenhouse tent in the summer? Dude, not for this show. But I don't know. There's no way I can know that. Where do you live? What seeds? What are you trying to do? I don't know. <laughs> DIY Honda says that donut story has an important lesson. Don't buy liabilities first. Buy assets that will pay you for your liabilities. Absolutely. Absolutely. You bought a business, then you bought a house. Then you bought more real property. Then he became rich. He did it in 10 years. Came here after losing everything when the communists took over uh, South Vietnam. One of the last guys out. You know, not quite pulled off the roof of the embassy, but in that same group of people. 10 years, he's a millionaire. What's your excuse? It was easier back then, says the person who didn't live through the 70s and the 80s. <laughs> Um, Philippine Nomad says day in, day out, Jack keeping it real, knocks it out of the park once again. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. John Derry, estimated release date of your aquaculture course. Again, probably in June, July at the latest. Jack, what is your favorite fruit to grow from Jonathan Camps? Blackberries. Blackberries and elderberries. Um, because they're easy, because you can grow them anywhere, and because you can do so many things with them, including some really badass meads. Um, let's see if anybody else. Philippine Momad says, loan you money. Do I look like a bank? A bank is a place you go to get money when you can prove you don't really need it. 4570 Lever Gun says, what do you think about Ruger taking over the Marla name, being a fan of Lever Guns? Mm -hmm. I don't really care. As long as they keep making them. And I hope they keep calling them Marlins. If they don't. And they all become Rugers as long as they make them the same way. I'm okay with it. I don't like seeing consolidation in the firearms industry, though. Consolidation equals power consolidation. Power consolidation means less targets by the people that want to shut down those groups. And, you know, everybody's cheering right now because Elon's going to buy Twitter and restore free speech. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. But what happens if we end up with only a few major manufacturers of firearms and people in the globalist community, instead of continuously pushing for regulations, just start buying them and shutting them down or starting to make typewriters or something with them? Just like that one time we took typewriter companies and made guns. So what if we just went the other direction? I know they wouldn't make typewriters, but you get my point. And when you have consolidation and centralization, you have more potential for that. Sounds like an opportunity for some entrepreneurs out there to uh, to fight that consolidation if you do it the right way. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did, remember, you can always support us by doing your online shopping at tspaz.com. That's T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. And if you start your shopping area, no matter what you buy, you will help support us and the work that we do. I'm going to do a little screen share with you guys right now um, that are on the live feed or watching the video after the fact and show you our item of the day today that you can find at T-SPAS. Anchors, Soundcore Life P2 True Wireless Earbuds. They're great for listening to podcasts or music on. If you look at them, they look a lot like an Apple AirPod. I would say they are every bit as good as an AirPod that costs 150 bucks for the Gen 3s. And uh, today, these are on sale for $39.99. They are made by, of course, Anchor, who is my favorite value brand in electronics. Everything they do is just top notch. These are great. And can I give you a little piece of advice? Can I really give you guys a little tiny piece of advice here when it comes to something you wear in your ear? White is not your color. It makes me think about something about Mary. 
I'll just leave it at that. White with that long little mic coming down it in your ear. Not your friend. Doesn't really look good. But remember, whether you want the item of the day or just to help support the show, if you start your online shopping at tspaz.com, you can uh, help us out no matter what you eventually buy. And Tom gets it. He just says a little comment there. Hair's yell. Indeed. Indeed. With that, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's show. I will be back tomorrow with another Just Jack show. I don't know what we're going to be talking about yet, but it'll be something cool. I hope this one helps you, and it will if you have sufficient motivation, imagination, and determination, and go get something done.